Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, this will be the last you'll be hearing from me today, I promise. The uh, topic today is not reinventing the wheel. So finally, something, uh, something new I can uh, talk about. And I'm really happy to have seen Mr. Eden's presentation um, because a lot of the problems or issues we see is uh, he, he came to the same conclusion. So that's fine. Unfortunately, for the CIA 447 version that by now you know I'm, I'm very active with, uh, such a system would be very difficult because if dynamically you get a new node ID after every wake up, it also means you have a complete new whitelist. So here we would need to have a method uh, to reprogram the whitelist after every wake up, uh, which would probably open up another whole new cans of worms again. So if we look at the attack vectors uh, uh, available to, to a hacker, then uh, I think one of the biggest changes while the interest in these uh, security issues became uh, more awareness uh, for, for everyone here is that suddenly more and more wireless interfaces are added to, to systems that in the past simply were closed systems. So where in the past a can or can open system always was considered closed, suddenly maybe just some cervic technicians or whoever plugs in a Bluetooth module or a Wi-Fi module and suddenly you open it up. And um, so we want to see what Mr. Elin showed in hardware. We are trying to find uh, software solutions to, to do it. And we are primarily looking at the attack of, of a sniffer or logger so that a hacker gets access to the canvas and let's assume uh, that we can now inject messages, read messages, what can we do and protection on that level. We are not trying to fix a security problem where a hacker has unlimited access. So if the hacker sits in a it's a police car and it's, the guy is in the police garage and works on the car all the time. That's something uh, we are not trying to, to attempt. So the, the typical things like record and replay of messages, that is something we need to be able to, to attack and uh, fix. Um, and the injection of, of messages, see what, what we can do there. However, I can immediately tell you the limit of a software solution here is that we can never really protect from a full denial of service attack, which means if at this sniffer level, a hacker has access and can produce the highest priority message, zero, at 100% bus load, hey, then on, on a software level, on any of the other controllers, we cannot do anything. But what we are trying to do is really authenticating individual messages or, or multiple messages and see on a software level um, what can we do. Of course, when we talk about uh, security and known algorithms and, and popular algorithms for encrypting, decrypting, or hashes, then one of the challenges in CAN, of course, is the small message size. Uh, some messages can be as small, but theoretically as zero bytes, but for more practical reasons, typically at least they will have one byte. And uh, another issue is that very often the data is known. Well, we, we might know that the data transferred, even if it gets, let's say, encrypted, one of the attack points for, for hackers is, well, if they can guess the data, they, there's many shortcuts to take. So if uh, in a, let's look at a can open system where an SDO access always has an index and a sub-index and a command specifier, then we immediately know what the first data byte is and we can take pretty good guesses about the next data bytes. And so this is uh, all a little difficult here with the small sizes and of course the the limited resources we now see new microcontrollers more and more microcontrollers coming up with uh, security features like true random generators or maybe uh, AES 128 and encryption engines uh, however can security also be added to existing smaller uh, microcontrollers and uh, so the, the popular security method uh, typically require a minimum of 128-bit block sizes, preferably larger. And uh, uh, also, what about real time? Can they be applied within microseconds? So these are all challenges we have to look at. 
Let me start with the key elements of the uh, CanCrypt solution that we came up with. And it's primarily a software framework. Nowhere in the entire software system do we really demand this particular encryption or decryption algorithms has to be used. Uh, we have it configurable and uh, we support four levels of, of security levels and the highest one or one of them is simply called custom. And here uh, anyone is free to add their own or modify the um, security algorithms specifically used. One thing we also provide in the software framework is some key management because in any system, security system, that's always an issue where do wet, which keys get generated and, and placed into the device. And we have a secure method to transfer the keys which is relatively slow but is without software overhead uh, very reliable. The two base communication features is either a grouping, which where multiple microcontrollers or devices nodes are grouped into um, a, a safe, secure group. This is based on an initial shared key and then a secure heartbeat. And this secure heartbeat constantly updates the shared key so that a record and replay attack doesn't work because the key changes uh, constantly. The pairing mode is just for two devices and uh, that we primarily use for the key transfer. So whenever a new key needs to be programmed into a device, that's where the pairing mode would be used. If we look at the key hierarchy that we support, uh, then the idea behind this is, and here I again look at the example of a, a taxi or a police car, then, well, there are multiple players who might want to place a key. There's the manufacturer of a device who might want to have a key to enable a bootloader or some internal configuration. Then at some point we have a system builder or a system integrator that is completely independent from the manufacturer but puts a system together and wants to say, oh, now we need a key on this level. But maybe to some point uh, the end owner says, oh, and I have one more device, a, a plug and play device that I also want to add. And then at this level, we would also need, need a key. So the idea here is that we have a, a key hierarchy, the uh, manufacturer key being of the highest priority, and uh, that we also have the option to combine that with a serial number. So if a manufacturer transfers data for a specific node uh, to customer end user that needs to program or a system integrator, it's, it can be combined with the serial number of the device so that it's really an individual uh, key access and, and not immediately usable on, um, on multiple devices. The key length is configurable from uh, 64 bits up to 1024, so we are pretty flexible there. And um, one of the main features in keeping the system alive is that all the grouped devices share a constantly updated dynamic key. And um, what, what happens is that over the bus, the secure heartbeat has encrypted random bytes, which on receive of the secure heartbeat gets decrypted. And out of all these random bytes from all of the participating dividers, the next key is generated. And uh, so the, the frequency with, uh, with which we can do it is up to 200 milliseconds or so. So theoretically, if you want to, you can have a new key generated every 200 milliseconds in, in the system. And uh, that is one of the bases to prohibit the replay attacks because anybody who's trying to record something and just replay it, he will have missed the key. And, and there will be a new key by, by that uh, point. Other factors that can influence the key update is not only the shared random values but also the initial permanent key and um, in various configurations we've played with we also use the message counter or sometimes even the data transferred as part of the new key generation. So um, the, the complexity level can be risen to whatever the security uh, demand is. 
So what we are doing on the bottom line here is that we are using a, a technology called the one-time pad. In encryption, the, the true one-time pad is unbreakable, is the highest level of security you can reach because it's just used once. So you cannot uh, reuse the key. It's used once and then thrown away. And uh, if you, you have a, such a key, then the nice thing is your encryption or decryption method can be very, very simple. A simple XOR is all you need. So that makes it quite efficient, but now the entire intelligence and, and work part goes not into the individual encryption and decryption, it goes into maintaining the one-time keypad. That's where the real work is now done. And uh, of course, we don't need 100% or the highest level of security here if we know that a denial of service attack can break our system anyway. So really the question is, uh, how good does our one-time pad need to be? And um, uh, currently, initially, we uh, initialize it based on one of the permanent keys. Uh, then the dynamic key goes into it, a message counter, as, and as I said, po po potentially also data goes into the calculation of these uh, one-time pads. I think I mentioned all of that, yes. Now, I already mentioned encryption and decryption. If I look at my current customer base, then there is only very few out there that truly need encryption of data. The most important thing right now, I think, is the authentication. If in a police car we switch on the blue light, is the controller sending the command authorized to switch my blue light on or off? That is uh, more of the question. And here we now come to some of the minimal precautions you can take to make your system very, very secure, right? Uh, well, we can say, um, similar to the previous approach uh, by uh, NXP, Mr. Eland, is that we say all devices must monitor the network for injected or unexpected messages, which means they look for CAN IDs that they know, hey, nobody else should use, it's mine. You, you, hey, you tried to send something with my CAN ID. What are you doing? And uh, then what we do is either produce an, an immediately an emergency or an alert message telling everyone else, hey, somebody is trying to send something which uh, belongs to me. Uh, at, and when we come to the secure heartbeats, then this is also a reason to immediately stop transmitting the secure heartbeat. Because this alert message maybe the attacker is smart enough to kill it. And with the message described by Mr. Eland, uh, a spoofer could then try to cut down and, and uh, specifically uh, kill the, the alert message. However, we would stop the, the secure heartbeat. The nice thing is that in the latest CIA 447 profile, this is already done. Uh, here, it's not done for security reasons, but um, as you know by now, it is a highly dynamic system where node IDs are assigned dynamically, and we added this to CIA 447 um, for double node ID protection and detection. So one of the uh, um, specifics is if I detect anybody else using a boot up or a heartbeat message that I own, then in CIA 447 the rule is well, then I step back and say, oh, there's a duplicate node ID here. Uh, so from the hacking point, we now make it very e easy to kill a node because all you need to do is send that node's heartbeat and it will say, oh, maybe here's a duplicate node ID. I'll step back and, and wait. So from a security point of view, we maybe need to review that at, at some point. So this is already partially existing. I now want to share with you a little bit more the details about the uh, secure heartbeat and, and the details, what's in there. The idea is that we use a 32-bit value as a signature. And uh, the 32-bit value consists of three random bytes and when I say random, then of course, to some of the microcontrollers out there, this is already the first challenge. 
because uh, any security algorithm when it comes to random numbers requires a good random value. Uh, it, uh, if you take the default compiler's rand function with, uh, worst case, the same seed or just a, a few selection of seed, then uh, the random values in chain will always be the same. So, so that wouldn't help. So we need uh, something good here. And the, th the th fourth byte is simply a checksum of the previous three. So uh, that is the, the part of the signature. And these four bytes then, the random number with the checksum, are encrypted using the current dynamic one-time keypad that is shared with all devices and then gets uh, transmitted. So, and, and this encryption is a symbol XOR, but it comes from the one-time pad. On the receiving side, what do we do here? Well, we receive the four bytes, we decrypt them, then we double check if the checksum matches, and if it does, then we continue. If it does not, we stop producing our heartbeat. And continuation at this point also means that we take the decrypted random bytes from us and all other nodes to generate a new key. So really, the keys differ not only a little bit from step to step. No, it's like almost a complete new key. Well, it is a new key uh, that the devices share at this point. How does that look in, in CAN traffic? What is really uh, done in, to get started? Well, we have a message for used for, for a grouping request. So initially, when we start, all devices participating uh, transmit the grouping request message. And it also contains three random numbers, which currently are plain text. Because when we start, we didn't yet negotiate a, a one-time key. So in the grouping request, these are just plain text uh, random numbers. And here in the end, the MI is missing nodes. This is uh, the number of nodes I'm expecting. Uh, these systems uh, set up here would also at least as a minimum require that they know their communication partners. So, hey, I need to have at least, I'm expecting three, four, five or so communication partners. Um, after a timeout, these grouping requests are repeated until everyone saw everyone, meaning this missing nodes goes down to zero until all participating nodes have sent this message one um, with the value zero. And then to initialize the, uh, the dynamic key, the devices take the random numbers that are all collected and use that as a key input for the permanent key. So we start this off with the permanent key or a last session key. If, uh, if from the last power down we saved a last session key, we start with that one uh, to get started. And after um, the, the grouping requests are completed, then the secure heartbeats starts. Um, when it comes to the timing of the secure heartbeats, then, um, of course, these need to be synchronized in some way because we need from every participant exactly one of these secure heartbeats so that we can build the new key and continue. And we implemented these uh, self-synchronizing. Self there is a heartbeat event time. However, that will be shortened down to zero as soon as I receive somebody else's heartbeat, secure heartbeat. So what we do is in, in our own timeout routine for waiting for a secure heartbeat, that will be shortened uh, if already a heart, somebody else has started the next heartbeat cycles. Then we will join in. And so um, the, the nodes always synchronize with each others for these secure heartbeats. Let's review what we have until now. We have now authenticated communication because we double check every node, if it's implemented on every node, double checks that nobody is messing with my CAN identifiers. And only as long as I, as a participating node, 
do not see any suspicious events, do I keep on producing my heartbeats? On the consumer side, this means authentication is not immediate. If I receive a message, I don't know yet if this is authenticated. I have to wait until the next secure heartbeat cycle, and only if that is completed and I have everything uh, matched for, for all of the devices, then I know everything that was transmitted up to here is authenticated because nobody complained. Unfortunately, the last footnote I have to point out, now depending on driver implementations and the FIFO's delays down to the books, to be 100% sure you actually need to wait two heartbeat cycles. Because there could be some delays that the message came out just before the heartbeat, but is not yet part of the, the authentication. We have some optimizations here to, to shortcut that or to specifically request, but I just want to, to mention it right away that by the book one would need to wait um, that long. Let's review what we can do in, in, in pairing and secure messaging. Now, if, um, if we want to exchange something just between two nodes, then uh, there was a paper, when, when were we in Wien? I think uh, Bosch presented their Secure method, was that two years ago, three years ago? In, oh, one and a half. Okay. Um, that, we took this a little bit as an inspiration. Your solution was a hardware solution within the CAN messages where two nodes could uh, exchange information without the other one seeing. And we took this to a different level on, a, on the message size. And to explain it to you in, in simple words, let's assume that looking at the CAN identifiers in the range from 10 to 1F. And uh, two nodes can randomly select which of these two IDs they will be using for a transmit, and the data in there is zero. It's, it's really just about transmit, randomly picking two of these messages and sending them on the bus. So what happens then to anyone watching the traffic they will see two messages in the range from 10 to 1F, but because they were randomly picked by the two devices, if I look at the traffic, I have no clue who sent what. If I just look at the recording, if I go to the transceiver level, of course, sure, again, then I, I know it. But if I just look at the bus and I see message 12 and 15, I have no idea which of the two picked what. But the two nodes, who did this, they know. They know, hey, I did the 10, then the other guy must have done the 15, or, or vice versa. And from that information, we can derive one bit. So we suddenly exchanged one bit securely, because nobody else can understand, unless they go on the transceiver level, uh, who did what. So when we do this over and over again, we can do, do more. And uh, we, we use one more trigger message as a synchronize so, so that you know uh, uh, when to send those. So we need that. And of course, you need some sort of, of timeout. The fastest we have tried this uh, with, we didn't want to overdo it, is 10 milliseconds. So every 10 milliseconds, you get one bit. And uh, of course, if both of the nodes uh, se randomly selected the same, then they'll both notice and have to do again. So if, if both nodes uh, in one cycle selected, oh, I have message number 12, you have number 12, okay, we'll just try again. So there will be some, some delays here. This is just summarizing. So, so what we do is that uh, the, what we call the configurator, who, who might be in later initiating uh, a transfer, um, starts a bit generation cycle start, and then either with a random delay or immediately in response to this, there's different configuration. The, the two devices generate their messages, and by the end of the cycle, they know they exchanged one bit. Pseudo code is also in the uh, uh, papers, works quite well. Now, what we are building here 
this is a true one-time pad because at the end, let's say they do this for 32 bits, the two nodes now generated a 32-bit random value that both nodes have, the others don't. And if I want to transmit a key, then the configurator now can again use a simple XOR. So there's one more message with 32 bits of data and an XOR value that is added uh, XOR to the uh, random value and it gives you the, the next 32 bits. Now, uh, so it's definitely not suitable for larger data blocks, but good enough for securely transfer keys. And uh, if we assume a 10 millisecond cycle uh, with some of the other delays involved, uh, real, uh, real measurements in, in our first software implementations were 1.6 seconds for a 128-bit key or 256-bit uh, key at about 3.2 seconds. At this level, I need to point out that this mechanism by itself does not do anything for authentication. Because if one of these two nodes now is the bad guy, he could participate in this mechanism and we wouldn't know, uh, would have never authenticated it. To also authenticate it, what we built in is that when it comes to the bit selection, there's also a combination with the permanent key in a device. And uh, this way, only two partners with the same permanent key would generate the same random, random sequence. Now, one more thing we, we also uh, had to add uh, is of, to keep it complete is the secure messaging. So, so how can we really say without waiting for any delays or heartbeats, say this by itself uh, is a secure message. And um, we do this by message duplication, very much as in safety solutions. Uh, when you need overhead, what's the easiest way to do it? Well, just uh, duplicate the messages. So if a message is considered secured, it gets what we call a preamble, similar to in, in safety applications. And the contents here is that there are various counters in here. There's configuration data. There's checksumming for, uh, for authentication in here. And again, there's uh, anything not used will be filled with random data to make attack vectors a little bit more, more difficult. And we can actually also configure um, which bytes of in a message should be encrypted or not. So you can choose to not encrypt anything or only encrypt portions of it. And the idea here is, as what I mentioned earlier, if this is a can open SDO message, then we already know what the first byte is because the command specifiers are known. And so it doesn't really make sense to, to encrypt it. It just makes the life easier for the attacker to decrypt it. So uh, in speaking in SDO transfers, the only thing we would protect or encrypt is possibly the data itself, but not the index or some index or the meta metadata. Oh, my daughter's calling. Yeah, I'll take that call just a <laughs> second. Um, Again, here, this, the, the security algorithms here will be uh, uh, configurable, so depending on, on level. And um, uh, at the highest end, uh, the framework supports AES 128-bit, um, because then that's just what these two frames cover. So you immediately have with these two frames, two times eight bytes, the, the 128 bits. To maybe uh, one last note before I, I conclude here is that the other default algorithms we have chosen is something called the spec cipher. Um, it is a, a cipher published by the NSA. Hmm. I was quite reluctant in the beginning. Do I really want to adopt an, a cipher that was published by the NSA because they probably have the keys somewhere in their drawer already. Uh, it was published in 2013 as a lightweight uh, uh, cipher. And since then, multiple universities all over the world have attempted to find any backdoors to it. And so far, there are none. So I said, OK, for default implementation, 
that's good enough. And uh, just to give you an idea, uh, the measurements we made um, were on a, on a Cortex M3. Oh, Ralph, you have to help me here. Uh, on a Cortex M3 running at their typical 80 megahertz or so, um, was it in the tens of microseconds? Is that about right, Ralph? What would you say? Don't know. That's, I can look at it. Well, it's actually, we have the numbers published in our book. So uh, somewhere in the appendix, you'll, you'll find those. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you. Um, thank you. And uh, thanks for your uh, nice reflection to our uh, plug and secure key generation from the last CAN conference. Are there any questions from the audience here? Ralph Hildebrand from Fraunhofer IPMS. You've talked, uh, you've said that you are using a one-time pad for encryption, and you are generating this one-time pad uh, using this exchange between uh, two nodes, uh, sending one frame from, uh, from a range of IDs to uh, exchange one bit. Mm -hmm. uh, what about if an attacker would interfere with this mechanism? What about if an attacker would uh, transmit a frame within this ID range. Okay, then the, the two uh, nodes that want exchange data, will exchange data, uh, will notice this. But wouldn't it be a denial of service if, if an attacker would interfere into this exchange of the OTP? Uh, thank you, good question. The, uh, as I said, we expect exactly two messages in, in this frame. So uh, because there's two nodes participating, we have a start window, a trigger message, and we have a timeout. So in this window, we are expecting exactly two messages for the, the system to work. Now, the, the cases I can think of is that if a spoofer intruder injects any other third messages, he broke the cycle. So it's another denial of service attack that he can do anyway, but he would not at this point influence the key, so because it, it would not be used. Um, the, the one where he would influence the key generation is in the case where both try to transmit the same node ID, and now it transmits it's out there. Um, it's, it's a good point. I, I have to really, uh, I, I can't honestly answer this that we, we took 100% care of it. I would say um, he can't immediately know the key from that because he wouldn't still know the other twos. Hmm. But, okay. Yes. I, Well, we wait until the end of the cycle, and if one message comes in, uh, is when, if there's too many cycles, they, they'll know. So, so that's, but the, uh, what you just said, the, the only backdoor I can see is if the random generators in the two nodes are so bad that they produce the same messages every time over and over again, <laughs> and then a spoofer injects always the message, then it would be a known key, but then it wouldn't be a, a random, good random number anymore. I have a comment to this yes. topic. Uh, I think um, the no, I lost the uh, faden uh, The point is that the attacker in this case, where Alice and Bob let, let's call them Alice and Bob send the same ID, and the attacker sends another ID, then Alice and Bob will assume a wrong key, mm -hmm. so they won't be able to communicate. But the attacker also doesn't know if Alice and Bob send the same, or maybe. Alice sent key, uh, ID one, and Bob sent the same as the attacker. Mm -hmm. So also the attacker won't have the right key. So at the end, they will all end up with wrong keys. So this is my opinion. Okay. And so it's, it's another, it's, it's, it's a denial of service. Okay. So, so you have no chance, I think, to get the actual key, but you disturb. Well, just maybe to, to finish up on this, uh, because what we are doing here is 
quite different in, in security from, from what a lot of others do, is we, we know that we have to set up some sort of bounty program to attract hackers and, and will do. So, we, so there will be definitely a, a bounty uh, project and all of you I invite start, start hacking. Uh, the, the code for it uh, that, that will be part of the bounty is already a free download from our webpage today. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, we, we just unplug your uh, computer. I have in this adapter uh, is okay. mine. Sorry. Okay. Uh, ju just one. Yep. Just one simple question. Uh, the final final mm -hmm. question from my side. Um, we have talked already about that, but again, your your method to generate the paired keys is it somehow applicable to other systems not? can based i well if in any communication network where two transmitters can send at the same time something with the same id could i, I would okay. need to review but okay we will take it as an exercise <laughs> and we will see what comes up thank you